Okay. All right. So it should be recording. Okay. So the focus of this, and we're dealing with uh, chapters. Uh, actually, let me check really quick. We should be in chapters seven and eight. Yeah. Chapter seven and eight. Parts of chapters seven and eight now. Now we've dealt with some stuff with chapter seven, but we're in chapter seven and eight of the Open Stax US One History Textbook. Okay. So I'm going to lecture you a little bit today and let me get the chat going in case you have a question and you can speak up if you have a question uh, during my lecture. And if you don't, that's okay too. I mean, it's just a you know, typical college history lecture here, right? You can get a lot of these as you go off to college. Uh, but I'm going to speak to you about the Confederation, the Constitution today, so give you a little bit of history behind it and some of the developments that occurred. Uh, the Confederation, of course, we're talking about that. We're talking the Articles of Confederation, which is the original Constitution of the United States, and one that was not successful or it would have lasted, right? And then, of course, our second Constitution, which is governing our current presidential election, right? Which is still going on. We don't have results on from yesterday. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the Constitution has lasted. Sometimes when I give a lecture or I, talk, I, start, or I start a new chapter, right, I like to talk a little bit about some themes that we'll be covering. So we want to look at the first Constitution's achievements and problems. And notice what it says there, achievements and problems. Uh, the Articles of Confederation, of course, that it tends to be looked down upon, and perhaps it should be in our nation's history because it didn't last, but there were some achievements that occurred under it. Uh, a little bit about the Constitutional Convention of 1787, and we'll go into tremendous detail on that. We'll probably do some stuff with that in the next week or so. Uh, but, you know, these lectures are just overviews. You could do an entire lecture on just that convention. You could probably do a week's worth of lectures on just that convention. Uh, and then, of course, we'll talk about the separation of powers and checks and balances. And that's where I fear this may be a little bit repetitive for you kids because you've had government. You had social studies, too, with me. And you may remember, I mean, that, that chart is probably still on the chalkboard behind you, right? Maybe you remember we did that early in the course. I, I presented to the kids, you know, we talked a little bit about, okay, what's a legislative branch and all that stuff. So some repeat, but hopefully some new insight uh, with this lecture today. Let me know if I go too fast, of course. I know a lot of you right, like to get this down. And the, your, your test essay you just, just completed, one of those was based on my lecture notes. So I usually do try and have at least one test essay based on a lecture, at least part of a lecture. Okay, so Articles of Confederation. First Constitution of the United States, right? You could see a flaw right away in that second bullet there, in that the only thing it created was a national legislature to pass laws. There's a fundamental flaw in governments when there's really only one branch of government, right? And of course, we may be more commonly think of a flawed government being a dictatorship, a person with absolute power, and there's no checks on his power because there's tremendous potential for abuse in that system. And those abuses can be horrible, leading to death and ex exploitation of human beings. But really, if you just have a government that just has one branch, even if it's just a legislative branch with many members, that potential still exists. And so I think under the articles, the founders at the time were thinking, well, if we have just one branch, but everybody meets and talks, we'll work thing out, we'll work things out. Um, you, you know, the, that, that can't turn into a monarchy or, or a dictatorship. And to be fair, the founding fathers really made this so weak that it wasn't going to. But we do see cases in history in which that happens. And of course, I'm thinking of the French Revolution. The French Revolution will try and create a legislative body in the form of the, uh, the States General and the National Assembly. And that legislative branch becomes incredibly abusive with its power. Maybe you remember learning, maybe way back in your freshman year, about Robespierre and the Reign of Terror and the Guillotine. That was a legislative branch that had no checks on it and uh, killed thousands of people, right? So our system that's in place now in which each branch tries to check each other is, is the ideal. And that didn't happen, of course, under the articles. So there's already a flaw in it right away, just one branch. Now, once again, 
perhaps our founding fathers were trying to avoid that flaw of one branch becoming too powerful because in this, in this case, the branch was particularly weak, right? You needed unanimous support to pass major pieces of legislation. There was some legislation that could be passed where you didn't need unanimous support. But as I'm sure you are aware of, and we probably did this when you're sophomores, so we're not trying to do some different lessons this time, right? But maybe remember when we were sophomores, we tried to figure out the weaknesses of that. And what's the obvious weakness of that? You rarely have unanimous consent on everything, right? On, or on anything. It's very difficult to get unanimous consent. Usually somebody disagrees, okay? So that's a, a fundamental weakness. The national government had no power to tax. Uh, the philosophy was states should just donate money or funds to help the national government. That's really, that's really if ever is going to happen. When states have more power in a united or confederate system, they're going to tend to look out for themselves more than they're going to look, tend to look out for the national government. And that's a huge problem coming out of the American Revolution in which American debt is great. I mean, we can't even pay our troops, which is going to be a key flaw that's going to lead to Shays' Rebellion, which I'm going to have you look at tomorrow. Now, the key philosophy with the Articles of Confederation is the preservation of states' rights. We had just rebelled against a monarchy. The United States had just rebelled against a monarchy. They don't want a, a, something in place that could lead to another monarchy. So the key is that the states have power. Think of all those things we talked about leading up to the revolution where the colonies felt that their individual power to legislate and to be represented was taken away. You can see why the founding fathers were very wary of creating a constitution in which that could happen again. So you can see the reasoning for the Articles of Confederation as well as the flaws, okay? Now, that doesn't mean that there wasn't some successes, okay? And those successes are gonna happen in the formation of land, okay? Uh, how, how the country acquires land and how it organizes land. And that might be the chief success of the Articles of Confederation. So I'm gonna mention actually two ordinances here that deal with this territory, okay? What'll become the Northwest Territory. When you're a sophomore, you learned about the Northwest Ordinance. There's also another ordinance related to this, which is the Ordinance of 1785, which dealt with the organization of this land. So this is land that's gonna be acquired um, through the, um, the results of both the French and American, French and Indian War, but also of course the American Revolution, right? In the French and Indian War, France loses, right? And England acquires all this territory. And then of course, when the revolution ends, the United States gets all this territory. But if you look here, there's, there's, there's going to be some forts in this region that England still occupies, and that's going to be problematic leading up to the War of 1812. Uh, but uh, organizing, you know, what do we do with this territory? How are we going to organize it? Uh, do we want this territory to become states? You know, all those things, right? Do we want to build upon those 13 counties? The issue of slavery, right? What's, what new territories are going to be free? What new territories are going to be enslaved? all that stuff, okay? All right, so Ordinance of 1785. This is really exciting stuff, kids, let me tell you. But <laughs> this is how, so the key to Ordinance of 1785 is how land is organized. And this is a precedent that's established throughout United States history whenever it acquires new territory. And you can literally see it when you like fly you know, next time maybe if, if you fly, I mean, I haven't been on a plane since COVID, right? And, I'm kind of reluctant to get on one right now, but hopefully things will return to normal eventually, right? But when you fly across the country and you look down and you see a lot of squares, right? Fields and all that stuff, that system started to be put in place, the Ordinance of 1785. So what that ordinance did is it established a system for dividing and sell selling public land. And there were three divisions that were established, or three provisions. Public land was divided into townships of six square miles. Right? So typically when a township is organized, it's six square miles. Each township was divided into 36 sections, each 640 acres or one square mile. Okay, my head's already starting to spin because this is math, right? I, I, am the, I would be a horrible math teacher, right? Uh, each section could be purchased for a dollar per acre. Dollar was worth a lot more than it was back then, but that's maybe still not seen as an unreasonable price. Uh, the goal, of course, was to raise revenue for the new government. So. Think about what I said about a weakness of the Articles of Confederation is the ability to raise funds for the new federal government, okay? 
um, the weakness in taxation. So, hey, we've got this Northwest Territory, right? Let's see if we can organize it and let's see if we can generate some money that way without having to tax people because taxation, at least taxation without representation was a key cause leading up to the American Revolution. And that's a whole other debate, you know, both sides politically these days will argue, well, you shouldn't raise taxes because we've always been against taxation. And then the other side says, well, we need to raise taxes. That's fiscally sound. It also provides good services. People are against taxation without representation, not necessarily taxation itself, right? Still have all these debates. Okay. I'm just pausing because I, that was a lot on that slide, and I know a lot of you like to get this down. But here's an image for you. So this is kind of how the typical township was, would be divided up under the Northwest Ordinance, right? You got your township, right, with six square miles, and then with each individual square, you've got this acreage, okay? So the Ordinance of 1785 is really responsible for how American towns are organized and land was organized going forward throughout our nation's history. So that's an achievement of the Articles of Confederation, right? And an ordinance you probably didn't encounter when you're sophomore. So maybe this is actually new to you. Now the ordinance, uh, oops, a little bit more on this. Sorry, I don't have my cheat sheet with me here. So legacy of the ordinance of 1785 did not raise as much money as was hoped, but established a precedent for surveying and buying public land, okay? Kind of neat, my son worked as a surveyor last summer for a local company. Two, impacted the landscape by creating a checkerboard pattern. And once again, that's an example I was trying to, especially like if you fly out like, you know, you fly out over the Great Plains, you fly out over like Nebraska and stuff, you can literally look down, it's like square, 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 right? Now, of course, some of that is farming and things like that, but it's a similar organizational pattern. Okay. Now, of course, the clash that will occur here is Native Americans, right? Native Americans, many of them are nomadic, and they don't like this rigid organization of land, right? They don't believe in it, and that'll be part of the clash of those two cultures going forward. By the way, kids, I think we're done at, yep, we're done at 42 today. So just wanted to remind you of time on that doc time schedule. So hey, at least you don't get a 50 minute lecture today, huh? All right, now, back to this transition. Ordinance you probably heard of because usually I have my sophomore classes do an activity with Northwest Ordinance or do some type of assignment with it. Or the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, which is gonna to apply to the same territory. This will provide the process by which new states could join the union. So we're gonna organize that territory in the Northwest surrounding the Great Lakes, right? We're gonna organize that. What about that territory becoming a state? What are we gonna do there, okay? So we provided, so the Northwest Ordinance is gonna provide the process by which new states could join the union, okay? Uh, territories would receive one representative of Congress when the population reached 5,000 voters, right? White males. So we establish a territory Territory is organized, 5,000 people settle it. They can now have a representative in Congress to uh, deal with any uh, issues that may arise in that territory. Can't be a state yet, right? Territories could apply for statehood when the total population reached 60,000. Okay. So that is a provision of the Northwest Ordinance. So as everybody goes to settle into those Northwest Territories, which there are strong incentives to, a lot of resources, some dang good land in those territories. You've got access to rivers and the Great Lakes, right? Great place for development. Great state of Ohio come out of it, for example, right? So and once that happens, you can apply for statehood and then get more representation. The benefit, of course, of going from a territory to a state is representation in Congress, greater representation in Congress. This could very well happen with Puerto Rico in the near future. I saw another article on that the other day. There's a lot of controversy with Puerto Rico, guys. Like when we first acquired it historically, 
we didn't even make it a territory because we didn't want them to even have a chance to apply for statehood originally. Of course, that has changed over time. Okay, I'm gonna move on now. Once again, just slow me down if I go too fast. So back to that map of the Northwest Territory, right? Each of the states in Northwest Territory became states for the Northwest Ordinance Procedure, right? Got Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, and that state up north. I'm sure you know which one I'm talking about, that one right there, okay? So those states are gonna organize that. And if you notice, Wisconsin, a little bit bigger on this map, Minnesota, part of Minnesota is gonna be carved out of Wisconsin. I'm sure you already know that because you've had this history before, but I have to make sure. Okay, all right. Now, the Northwest Ordinance is really an incredibly significant document in United States history. It is more significant than you might guess because it doesn't just deal with state or territories becoming states. It also establishes some precedents or uh, ways of doing things, rules, right? Standards going forward for the United States. And some of those, of course, are freedom of religion, which was already going to be, which is going to be, of course, enshrined in the Constitution, right, with the Bill of Rights. But that provision is in the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. It's to, these territories will have freedom of religion. You know, think about, you know, how this is maybe a little bit of a change, right? With the original 13 colonies, those were very religion based in some of their formation, right? Whether it was the Puritans of Massachusetts or the Quakers of Pennsylvania. Of course, the Quakers were enlightened. They were very much freedom of religion. Maryland had a strong Catholic focus, right? Northwest Territory, uh -uh, right? This is going to be freedom. Any, any faith can come here and worship as they see fit, okay? Or not worship at all. Trial by jury is going to be established, so people are arrested. Once again, think about the revolution. Think about the grievances of the colonists, upset that a British soldier could maybe commit a crime, right, and be tried in England, upset that a colonist could maybe get a crime and not have a right to a jury trial based on some of the intolerable acts that were passed, right? We're going to have trial by jury in the Northwest Territory. That's a precedent that is going to be established. And then maybe the key precedent going forward because of what's going to happen historically is slavery is going to be prohibited in the Northwest Territory. And I cannot stress the significance of that enough as we move on from this and we start to get into the Civil War at the end of the semester. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a strong abolitionist movement that's going to be born in the North, and you're going to have people in the South, at least rich people, become even more beholden to slavery because of the profitability of it, right? And they're going to want to spread it. And what are abolitionists going to say? No, you can't spread slavery to new territories because we established in the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 that slavery shall not exist in new territories. This was a precedent that was established. If you want to keep slavery in Louisiana, Georgia, Alabama, places like that, fine. But according to the Northwest Ordinance, way back in 1787, new territories cannot have slavery. And therefore, the expansion of slavery is going to be the central issue leading to the Civil War. There will be other issues, but that is going to be the big one. Okay, that'll lead to the Civil War. And abolitionists turned the Northwest Ordinance, Ordinance for their argument that slavery cannot expand in new territories. That is wrong, that is not what the Founding Fathers intended. Okay, so, success of the Articles of Confederation, land, two significant ordinances. Problems, a lot of problems, right? And I'm sure you're aware of these, once again, apologize for the repeat of history, but important to make sure right? Problems with the articles. Each state had one vote regardless of its population, okay? That's not fair, right? It's not fair that Virginia should only have one vote and have the same, you know, Virginia is one of the more heavily populated states in this time period. New York, of course, is. It's not fair that these two states, that their vote should only count uh, the same as a Rhode Island or a Delaware, right? That just, you're going to have, in that particular circumstance, you're going to have Rhode Island, small, states, less populated states, making decisions that affect these major population centers, these major economic centers of the young United States. That just doesn't seem right. Uh, unanimous support was needed for major pieces of legislation. That was already brought up. That rarely ever happens, okay? Rarely ever happens. And once again, what's the concept here? One state, one vote. 
Okay, that's the thinking. As I go through this lecture, I'm kind of trying to explain the philosophy and the thoughts and the reason why they were doing that. And here the concept, of course, is, hey, you're a state, you got one vote, it's just the way it is. You know, can't help it if you got more people than this. You know, every state has a vote. Uh, each state should just be equal in terms of power. I mean, is it fair that Virginia and New York should rule over Rhode Island and Delaware, right? I mean, so these are, these are the discussions and debates that are gonna occur in this uh, time period. Dramatically pausing just in case you're writing some things down here. Um, other problems? Well, this is just a little bit more with it. Just some content to kind of back up what I just said. Virginia, the largest state, I mean, look at the, the issue here with this one state, one vote, equal power concept. Virginia, the largest state, is going to have 750,000 people in this time period. And they're going to be on foot, equal footing with Delaware, right? As the smallest state with 60,000 people. That's quite a discrepancy, right? Virginia here, right? Quite a large state. And here's, here's a little Delaware. Hey, how you doing? Right? Okay. So there's some, you know, is it right that Delaware should have as much power in this particular situation as Virginia? Of course, if you're a Delawarean, right, you're going to say, yes, of course, right? If you're Virginia, you're like, what the what, right? You know, you're, that just doesn't seem right. There's got to be a better solution here. Uh, other problems, uh, each state had the power to negotiate treaties, coin their own money, declare war. That's kind of ridiculous. I mean, you what? Let's, you know, what is Virginia going to declare war with England and Delaware is going to still trade with England? Or is Delaware going to de declare war with France? And uh, I don't know, uh, uh, New York's going to lie with France. I mean, what the heck is going on here, right? I mean, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense if you're going to be, uh, you know, a United Nation, at least a little bit, right? Um, Coining their own money, that's really difficult with currency and different prices and inflation rates. And oh my gosh, can you imagine having to carry around 13 different quarters, right? You know, and geez, that doesn't make sense. Shouldn't we have one national commerce, right? Okay. So theoretically, one state could negotiate a trade deal with a nation another state was planning to go to war with, right? It's not a very united states in the Articles of Confederation. So some problems there. But also commerce is very key. Commerce was a key factor in, you know, going to war with England. The fact that England was trying to limit trade and smuggling was going on and all those things. And here, maybe you're trying to provide some type of freedom and how people determine their commerce, but it's turning into a jumble of uh, difficulty. And commerce is key to a good functioning society. Um, other things, problems with the articles. Each state had the ability to print its own money right which kind of goes with the others uh, once again this created confusion and inflation right uh, your virginia dollar might be worth more in virginia than it actually is in rhode island right or vice versa so that can be frustrating right i'm sure some of you have been to canada when you go up there you got to figure out what your dollar is worth right is it worth more or worth less right imagine doing that in each state um no authority to regulate commerce uh, now, we're talking about the federal government there, so no authority to regulate commerce. So that means, of course, you know, what, uh, what, what taxation might occur, what uh, wages might occur, uh, what type of products can be created, what type of uh, safety measures can be put in place. Um, regulating commerce, you don't want commerce to be regulated too much because that can restrict commercial activity, but some regulations are essential. Uh, for many different purposes, for trade and safety purposes, quality purposes. Uh, so there's no authority to do that under this current system. And this will cause states to create conflicting tariff and navigation laws, right? Who controls what ports, right? I mean, who can ship what to where? Um, could there be potential conflict that occurs among states because of this? You know, what if Georgia's upset with something that North Carolina is doing, you know? So you need some type of set system in place if these new states are truly going to be unified and have a successful economic system. Of course, a key person to be thankful for that, as many of you are probably learning due to the musical, was Alexander Hamilton, but more on that to come. 
uh, other problems. Uh, Congress had empowered and enforced its tax collection program. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, but what they tried to do was a tax quota program. So each state should set aside this certain percentage of revenue to contribute, right? Maybe it's a little bit, for those of you who go to church, maybe it's a little bit like tithing. Maybe you've heard of that, where you set aside a certain percentage that you contribute to the collection basket, right? Maybe that's what they're trying to do here, right? The problem is people don't always put money in the collection basket, right? So if you're not required to pay it, you're probably not going to always pay it. And that was really a big problem coming out of the American Revolution and the debt that the new country was carrying. Okay, so basically what's happening here is you've got 13 semi-sovereign nations, not one United States. So that's kind of a nice summary note of all the difficulties that are going on with the Articles of Confederation. So kids, just, you know, I know you just had an essay test, but think going forward, and this always changes, but I always like to announce things I'm considering, you know, good essay maybe on your next test is you know what problems exist with the articles and how do the founding fathers fix them which actually all of you should be good at by now once we get through this unit now some of the problems that are going to occur okay some of the problems that are going to occur are going to be based on events so the problems are going to manifest themselves based on events and one of those is Shays' Rebellion, which we're going to do a little bit more with tomorrow. Well, actually, maybe a lot more with tomorrow. So just let me kind of just outline here. I don't want to tell a lot of the story here. Try to read about it tonight as you read your chapter. But uh, Shays' Rebellion is going to occur in 1786 to 1787. Articles of Confederation are in place in those years. There are farmers in Massachusetts who are facing steep economic hardships. And many of those farmers had served in the Continental Army, right? So, you know, and they're not getting paid yet. So that's part of the issue. So they're dealing with mortgage foreclosures, they're dealing with tax delinquency, they can't make payments, right? Crop failures, things like that. Many of them are going to be placed in debtor's prisons, which really never made sense to me. Why do you have a debtor's prison? How does a person get out of debt when they're in prison? I mean, I get that you want a negative consequence for people not paying their bills, but that one never made sense to me. I mean, hey, the this person owes us some money. Let's put him in prison where he can't pay it off at all. But, you know, thinking of the time period, I guess, maybe there were other reasons for it. So what happens is this, um, there's a man by the name of Daniel Shays, right? He's a Revolutionary War veteran. Um, many of these veterans have not received the monies promised to them for their service in the war. The Continental Congress doesn't have it, they don't have it. He's gonna lead an army of 2,000 angry men, right? They're gonna uh, attack government buildings, right? They're gonna, what they're going to try and do is they're going to try and shut down courts and they're going to try and prevent foreclosures. This reminds me a little bit, I think, of a parallel. I mean, if you think like Great Depression, right, when banks would come out and try and foreclose on farms, farmers on the Great Plains, and farmers would literally be there with rifles saying, you're not taking my farm, and sometimes they would have help. So this is a similar situation. You're not taking our farms. You owe us money anyway, right? Now this rebellion will be crushed, but it will be crushed by state militias that are raised. Okay, and there's some concern that we need a stronger central government because one, we need to be able to pay these people, but two, you need a federal force in place to prevent rebellion like this, okay? If we want to keep this government together, we can't just let people rebel every time they have a grievance. There has to be some type of executive system in place to prevent this. And think about that going forward, right? Once again, the Civil War is going to take place. That's going to be the largest rebellion against the Union. 
and Lincoln will feel he has the power to put that down and that secession is illegal. That's going to be established coming out of things like Shay's Rebellion, okay? Now I'm leaving some things out here, but you'll get a little bit more about it tomorrow. Let's look at the impact of it. Uh, this is the first example of class warfare in the United States. Now, what do we mean by class warfare here? Well, bankers and mortgage lenders typically are of the upper class. Farmers are middling to lower class, depending on their, their status, their, their particular situation, and they rebel. Now we're going to see other examples of class warfare in US history, maybe fast forward to the Industrial Revolution and all the labor strikes that take place there, right? But what we see here is poor farmers versus wealthy merchants and bankers. This once again demonstrated the weakness of the national government to not really be able to respond to this situation. And the property classes are fearing mob rule. And the property classes are actually going to be the ones who are starting to call for a stronger central government. Okay. And this is why you have some versions of American history that are very cynical. Maybe think Howard Sin's People's History of the United States, in which he says it's elites who created the Constitution, and the Constitution is not as democratic as people think it is, right? That it was more about protecting the interests of elites. Now, that can be debated, but that's his interpretation based on situations like this and the property classes fearing mob rule. Maybe an argument like Howard Zinn's has some strength, but we talked about, we talked about, think about our conversation about the Declaration of Independence and Thomas Jefferson over the years. Maybe in those original documents, it was intended to provide liberties to elites, right? White men with property. But that definition of who's entitled to those things has definitely expanded across time. We can make an argument that it still needs to expand, but it's definitely expanded across time, right? So, all right, I only got five minutes, guys. So five minutes, time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> all right, so there will be a constitutional, constitutional convention called 1787, right? Not shocking to you kids. It's called to address the problems of the Articles of Confederation. It's going to include 55 delegates from all states except Rhode Island. Rhode Island is just that state. You know, they just have that heritage, kind of that legacy of being a little, you know, little Rhode Island. They're just, gosh dang, they're just kind of rogues, right? Sometimes it's called Rogues Island, right? They just like to go their own way. Remember when it was first founded, it was founded as a place where people could go that uh, were getting kicked out of other colonies, right? So it kind of has, kind of has that uh, heritage about it, right? We don't want to conform. Now, this will be called by some the greatest collection of minds under one roof in American history. All right, and I'm sure you know some people who are there. I'll mention some of those in a moment, okay? Now, others are gonna call it a collection of demagogues, right? And a collection of people coming together to make a stronger central governor, government and take away from the rights of the people, take away power of the people. Well, let me just close with who was there and who wasn't there and then we'll call it a day. And I'll record this lecture, but I may wait to post these notes. I got to look at it and like maybe see, maybe I could finish this next week. We'll see. Okay, so who's the key figures are there? Oops, I guess I kind of cut that off there with Ben's picture there. Okay, slide it over. So key figures, George Washington, Kind of seeing this famous picture, right? George Washington really doesn't say a whole lot at this. It's not like he's going to suggest a lot of ideas, but his presence is very significant to the convention because he is the man who led the army during the American Revolution. In many respects, he's just the man. He has a presence about him, a leadership style that is, he's just one of those people when he walks into a room, people notice, right? He's just got that stature about him. And him being there, the fact that he's a hero to the people, just lends credibility to the proceedings. Okay. 
Ben Franklin, who has a long career as a diplomat, lives to a ripe old age for this time period, spent a lot of time in France and England, but always tended to represent America well in those situations, will be a key negotiator at the end of the revolution with the Treaty of Paris, right? And he'll, he'll be one of the key authors of the Great Compromise that'll come about. And then James Madison, who at the time was, was very young, this is actually a pretty good picture of him. He almost looks like a gosh dang teenager here, right? Young, kind of quiet, but yet often known as the father of the Constitution due to how much he recorded of it and how much he actually wrote. And just seeming to pick his moments to say the right things. One more slide, kids. One more. As always, I appreciate you paying attention. The reality is I enjoy lecturing. I know it's not cool to do anymore, but I still kind of like doing it, so I appreciate it. Who is not at the convention? Thomas Jefferson was in France, and he's actually going to be critical of it. Thomas Jefferson is a person who does not like centralization of power. John Adams and Thomas Paine were both in Europe at the time. There's John and there's Thomas, author of Common Sense, right? So they're not going to be there. Samuel, Hank, Samuel Adams and John Hancock were actually not elected by their individual states to go. There's Samuel Adams okay, and John Hancock. And then Patrick Henry didn't attend. Uh, he's from Virginia. Okay. Patrick Henry didn't attend because he is very critical and concerned about centralization of power. He does not want the United States to become a monarchy. Uh, you may remember Patrick Henry for give me liberty or give me death. Concerning the Constitutional Convention, he says, I smell a rat. Okay. Kids try to read, well, what did I tell you? Chapter seven? Try to read chapter seven tonight. And that's it. No written work tonight. You guys have been doing a lot of that lately. You know, maybe at least start to read it before you go to bed tonight. It'll put you to sleep, right? Okay. Thanks for your attention, kids. Have a good day. I'll see you tomorrow through Zoom. Bye, guys.